I'm incredibly lazy, but I played in the NBA because I built systems that stop me. John Amici. Amici has spent years studying the world's highest performers in the sporting and corporate world. He was also the first Briton to play professional basketball in the NBA. I told them 45 minutes after I first put to my basketball, yeah, I'm gonna play in the NBA. And how did you get there? You can actually work out, depending on your postcode, the number of minutes you have on this planet. You've got this period of time to be remarkable, to be impactful, to be purposeful, to be joyful. Don't waste those moments. We're so inundated with so much information on how mm -hmm. to live your life correctly and even most joyfully and most profitably. Really productive people. They. It's no good reaching your goal as a husk. I hope you're not doing that because it doesn't work. I know. If you ask human beings, 95% of people will say, I'm highly self-aware. When you do a little bit of probing, 10 to 15% are actually self-aware. You need to know not just who you are, but how you're met by the world around you. How can we stay motivated? This is a nerd out area. What qualities would you say all the greatest leaders have in common? To be a great leader, you have to lots to do. I've just been planning out my day. However, with Revolut as my main account, I've got one less thing to worry about, money. I know my money's safe with Revolut, so I can focus on other important matters like planning a wedding. That is why I pay with Revolut. If Revolut detects anything suspicious with your transfer, you'll receive an in-app warning straight away. And how cool is this? You create a single use card in the app with just one tap. And then after the purchase is made, your details disappear immediately. So they cannot be reused. Now, if you happen to lose or misplace your card, which is never a fun time for anyone, but a surprisingly regular occurrence for me, you can freeze your card instantly through the Revolut app. And if there's anything I do need help with, Revolut's customer service team are on hand 24 seven via the in-app chat. It is a huge reassurance for me and just one of the many reasons why Revolut is the main account for all of my finances. But don't just take my word for it, over 35 million people around the world trust Revolut with their money. Join us and create your account today. It is an understatement to say that John Amici has had a career that has taken him places. Not only is he an organizational psychologist, an OBE, a New York Times bestselling author, a fellow of the Institute of Science and Technology, a professor of leadership, a non-executive director of a FTSE 250 company, and the founder of his own organizational psychology consultancy, APS. He was also, more surprisingly perhaps, the first Briton to play professional basketball in the NBA League, a move which saw him leave his hometown of Stockport for the world of professional basketball aged just 18. And whilst playing, he was the first ever NBA player to come out as gay. Never afraid to stand up and speak out, his book made me question a lot of things I thought I knew about myself and the way I kind of live and work. Amici has spent years studying the world's highest performers in both the sporting and corporate world. And I am so looking forward to everyone hearing his amazing techniques. I learned so much in this conversation and I am sure you will too. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure, thank you. I'm very excited for this conversation. Um, I'm gonna go straight into talking about your early life, if that's okay. Please. That's what like, we like to do to people early in the mornings, uh, get some good reflection. You speak a lot about growing up in Stockport, but I know that you were born in Boston. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about kind of the story of your early life? I don't actually remember very much of being, of growing up in Boston. I was only right. there for, th I think we left it when I was three. Mm -hmm. And so I remember very, very big spaces, the house that I lived in, I think mostly just comparative to a smaller me. Um, <laughs> and I don't remember anything. All I know about that period is what my mother told me about that period. Stockport obviously is home for me. And so I still, I still think very fondly of it, despite the fact that it was a in the 70s. Well, the black family moving in was very unusual right. in Stockport. And so even that kind of rocked the environment that was quite a, a, you know, parochial, suburban, pleasant, but homogenous space. Uh, I hated school back then. I know that much. Uh, but we had a wonderful family life. Our... <clears throat> the bits that I remember about my family life back there are, are the holidays. So we'd go to a caravan in in Rill. It's kind of mandatory if you grew up in the Northwest, you'd go to somewhere like Rill. And there was this place called the Rill Sun Center back then, which was a, 
a pool that had a wave machine and it just smelt of uh, fried fish, greasy chips, salt and vinegar, and chlorine. Uh, but we loved it. We'd go there, spend an entire day, day there, jumping in and out of the water and eating uh, fish and chips. It was amazing. Yeah, that but does sound amazing. It was really Wouldn't good. mind it now. Right? right? <laughs> not, not the healthiest uh, approach, no. but, but we'd, my mother created experiences for us. Um, every summer we'd do something that was an experience, so that was a common one. But then ice skating was another one. Uh, and she we, she bought us all matching, which we called them tea cozies, but like a gilet. And we wherever we went, we'd have badges that she would sew on. So we went to, uh, you know, the Blue John Mines, which is a quarry, and we'd stick a badge on for that. And so we'd have badges for all, th all the things that we did. Like Amazing swimming badges. Memories. Yeah. That's so great. Yeah. That's a really, really kind of lovely tidbit into your mother and who she was. You speak about her a lot in mm -hmm. your work. Can you tell me a little bit about kind of how important her role has been in your life and who you are today? Ever present. Um, she passed away, uh, died, had cancer <clears throat> a long, long time ago uh, when I was in my 20s. Um, but is ever present. She is a very good example, I think, of what what most of us of good conscience want to be to other people. The idea that we we survive by lingering in the memories mm -hmm. of other people, and so there isn't a day goes by where I don't think of something that she would have told me. Um, one of my students, I teach University of Exeter Business School, and one of my students, a grad student, uh, said to me of my last book which she was forced to read. They're all forced to read it. Uh, she said, do you know you're not the star of your book? And I was like, okay, that's a provocative way to start, <laughs> right? Um, she said, your mom's the star of your book. And she's absolutely right. And most of the things I write are stolen directly from her or at least attributable. So she, it's that kind of ever presence. It's sad in a way because it's a constant reminder of what you don't have, but it's right. also kind of wonderful because she's always there. Right. Sat in the background of my memory. Yeah, and it sounds like she really is in terms of the way you think and the way you respond to things and the way you kind of, as you said, even ever present in your work as well mm -hmm. and what you're seeing as you're growing psychology now, it originating from things that you kind of received from her. What were the most memorable things that she kind of told you? Like these things that have stayed with you constantly? Um, well, fundamental things about mm. aspiration. So she was the one who, who told me a phrase that I use now all the time for people, the idea that the most unlikely of people in the most improbable of circumstances can become extraordinary. Uh, I believed her. And I think part of my mission is to make sure that other people believe it too. This is not about the idea that anybody can do anything, because I think that's fanciful. Right. This idea if you... I forget what it's called, but people who do that thing where they think if I, if I say this in my head, it will happen. Yes, I don't believe in that right. because I think there are some limitations. I am six foot nine and old. I can't be an astronaut. I'm also bad at maths. So these things mean no to astronaut. But there's a world of possibility even now available to me as long as I'm willing to put in the effort, make the plan, develop the skills, deal with some setbacks and the mundanity of being, being brilliant at something eventually. Right, that's so interesting because I often think about how I also don't believe in manifestation. And yet also at the same time, there are a few things that really resonate with me and what I personally have ended up with as kind of my view of a manifestation that like works or resonates with me is the fact that when you're saying I'm going to be this, or I, it's a, all of the manifestation isn't around like, I want to be this. It's like, I am this and, you know, I will be this and kind of very much affirming the fact that you are something. Mm -hmm. What I do think that does is it allows you to see where you are currently not in a place that would welcome that. So for example, if you're talking about financial abundance and you're talking about kind of being very successful and financially free and all of those things, I think when you're manifesting that, for me, what seems to does seem to resonate is the fact that when you start saying, 
you know, I am financially free or even things like I am this job role that I specifically want. Those things start popping up that kind of highlight where it wouldn't be possible now and mm -hmm. your kind of current restrictive mm -hmm. patterns yep. that stop you from being in that place. I feel like I just explained that in a really roundabout way. No, no, no. I, I, there's so much of that that I, because my head always does this, a little like, where's the science in this? And so, but there's really good science in this, right? The idea that if you can visualize beyond a number what you want in the future, because I think many people, when they manifest, what they're doing is picking a number. Right. Uh, instead of thinking, what is this? There's a, there's a term in science fiction uh, called a future history. If you, you mentioned that before that you read some science fiction, right? And it creates this picture of the, the future that is so vivid that it's as if the author has been there and witnessed it and is telling you about what they saw. So it's not thin. It's not just there is a pill, there is a flying car. Right. It's vivid it's and rich. Building. And if people can create that vivid and rich picture of what their life is, then they can work backwards and say, what needs to be true for that to happen? To your point, what are the things around me right now that aren't helping me get there? But also what additionally might I need to do or shift in order to get to that picture of the future? So I think that's... So true. And I think you've just explained it in a far better way than I had. Um, thank you to only my one coffee this morning um, and my ability to be, inability to be concise. I would say that that is, the reason I think that is kind of so true and the reason that resonates with me so strongly is because actually the only form of manifestation that I do and that I found really, really useful is exactly that. It's writing a current diary entry or a diary entry in the present, mm -hmm. but for the future. Mm -hmm. So say it would be today, it would be the 2nd of February, 2025. And I'd be writing about my current life, my current achievements, my current situation. And what that always highlights to me is actually that can't happen because then all of these things would have to happen. And actually those things are things that I don't want, yep. which I think is a really helpful tool in kind of being able to take away the idealization of what you want and actually being able to realize, okay, as you say, like brilliance comes with being mundane and brilliance comes with like monotony and needing to be really kind of repetitive in a number of things. And actually then if I looked at my next year and thinking, I actually don't want to do that every yep. single day. To me, that's always been so helpful or a professional bio a year in the future. I often do that. So oh, it's kind cool. of like you know, Grace Beverly has done this, this, and yeah. this. She's, you know, well known for doing this. And I'll do that for like five years in the future. That to me is one of the most powerful things, not necessarily of manifestation, but of kind of, I don't know, placing yourself in the future and allowing yourself to kind of not just reverse engineer what that would have to look like, but also be able to kind of place yourself, like, could I do these 20 things? No, but I could probably do these three. Yes. It's also a reward, right? The the idea that your your bio will be not flattering, but certainly will be more than mm. who you are now. So there's a way of you're going to do all this hard work to do something incredibly difficult. So you might as well reward yourself by at least giving yourself that wonderfully vivid picture of what it's like so that you can kind of bask in the enjoyment of it while you know what you're in for right. to get there. Some some slog, some boredom, some challenge, some conflict. But you can still see this picture. You see this a lot with people. They fail because their image of what they want for the future is either wildly unrealistic. Right. Um, as in it's not really even science fiction. It's, it's, it's a fantasy beyond that. Or it's not got any meat to it. It's not got any, there's nothing to grab hold of because it's a number. I want to make a million pounds. I want to, I don't know, there's a, a postcode you want to live in. And it's just not enough. Right. to drag you through the tough stuff that you need to do to get there. Right, absolutely. It has to be stronger and it has to be more of a micro look at things as well. Like here are the five things that would actually even get to that point rather than just like wishing on a star with that end yeah, yeah. goal. When your mind is, is sore from your efforts and you are trying to get off to sleep, you need more than just a cold number right. to grant you a bit of recuperation. You need to close your eyes and see that image of the future, that five year from now bio. I love that idea. Um, you need that. Otherwise, it's just too hard a slog for many people. Mm, and it's too far away. Mm -hmm. Before we come on to talking about more of that kind of psychology aspect, which I want to spend a lot of time talking about, I want to 
talk about your move into the NBA. Mm -hmm. Obviously, moving from the UK into the NBA, she says, as if the NBA is a country, <laughs> is wasn't that kind of realistic, common, you know, seen as a regular career move. Can you tell me a little bit about how that even came about? So I was walking down, I used to go into Manchester rarely. Manchester, Stockport is only, what, four or five miles away from Manchester, but, but now it's kind of eaten up by Greater Manchester. But back in the day, it was a big trip to go into Manchester. And I would go into Manchester only to go to the Central Library, this amazing venue where you could get any book you wanted. And I would go, and I would go to Central Library, pick up books, and then go to, it wasn't called Greg's, it was called the Mar Martins, but essentially right. it was Greg's. And, <laughs> um, and I would buy steak slices and I would get books and I would just, my arms would be full of books and steak slices. <laughs> By the time I finished my trip to Manchester, that's what it was all about for me. <laughs> 17 years old, and I get stopped. A lot of times people stop me and they say, I'm sure it's interesting to them, but it's incredibly dense to me because I know that I'm tall. So when people say, wow, you're tall, it's like, yes, I know. Mm -hmm. And a man came up to me and stopped me, and I was about to be disinterested right? because he was going to say something stupid. And instead he looked at me and he said, well, he, what he didn't say was more important first. He didn't say you should play basketball, which right. I hate. People tell me that today as an old man with a white beard. I very clearly should not be playing basketball. I should be <laughs> taking care of my hips. Um, he didn't say that. And he didn't say, you know, do you want to play basketball? Because I would have said, no, I've got books and steak, steak slices. slices. I don't you really know, want to be eating my steak Exercise, slices. right? <laughs> he said, you'd be great at it. And it was such an interesting moment for me because no one, no stranger had ever told me I would be great at something. Right. And it was instantly intoxicating. Instantly like. And I, by the way, I didn't know what basketball was. I had no idea. It's just, you could be great at something. Yeah, perfect, sold. He could have said Zumba and I would have been in, right? Uh, that would have been a different it career. It would have been a very different career. But still fun. <clears throat> I, I imagine so, actually. I, I do have a friend who's a Zumba instructor and he seems to, his life is fun. Um, but it's, yeah, it was, that was the thing. It's like, it just stuck. And he's, he gave me a card or, or, or something and I, and I contacted this person who wasn't him and I ended up playing then. And, and the other part is I, I arrived in this horrible urine smelling community gym in Chalton, South Manchester. It was wet. I stood outside and I could hear basketballs bouncing in the, in the gym. And I stood outside in, in rugby kit because that's all the only kit that I had for, and plimsolls. I remember Plimsolls. Oh, you do? Wow. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. I'm surprised. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> so there I am with Plimsolls and, and a rugby kit stood outside in the rain. And I don't want to go in because it's strangers, random people. And I walk in and everything stops. Basketball bouncing on the floor away from us. And, and they all run towards me, which in my experience is a bad thing. <laughs> but instead they run towards me and they're like, you're on our team. And, and my heart was just, it's like, this is the most amazing experience. And then I immediately felt guilt because I was like, you don't realize I'm, right. <laughs> I've never done this. I don't know what this is. We start to play. My first experience is that, that someone throws me a basketball and it hits me square in the chest. I miss it. <laughs> Clap my hands. Missed it. I pick it up sheepishly. We continue to play. Nobody said anything. It's really interesting. Nobody said anything like you're terrible or no look on someone's face to indicate to me that I was doomed. I caught it the next time. Felt like that was an achievement. And then after the third time I catch it, they're like, shoot the ball. And I suddenly realized, I don't know what that means. What, what is shoot the ball? I'd watched other people throw it into the thing, but no one had told me how to shoot a basketball. So I threw it up. I missed by about six feet. Right. And... Um, and one of the kids looks at me and then looks at everybody and goes, that's his first shot. And he only missed by six feet. What, what, and what amazing maturity, right? We call that a growth mindset nowadays, the idea of reframing failure. And I thought, I am never leaving this space. And, and people don't realize, I don't like to exercise. I'm not interested in exercise. I don't like to sweat. I like books and I like pie. We that's have a lot like. in common. <laughs> that's what I like, right? <laughs> And I, but I sat in this place and it was like, it stinks in here. It's freezing cold. 
It's wet outside. I have to take two buses to get here and I'm never leaving this place. I sat with them at the end while they're undoing their basketball boots and I'm just sat there waiting. And they start talking about the NBA. This, this place where the best players play. And I, in my brain, all I did was, I didn't know anything about money or professional leagues. <clears throat> it was just the idea that it's America where the sun always shines that I thought ridiculously. So it's like, I can have all of this nice, lovely feeling, but be where the sun always shines. I'll do that. So I told them 45 minutes after I first put to my basketball, yeah, I'm going to play in the NBA. And they looked at me and said, yeah, of course you will. Ridiculous. But that's, that's what it's like to have proper teammates, right? People mm -hmm. who, there was no sense of jealousy. To this day, there's no sense of anything other than, and indeed they don't take any credit. There's lots of people who try and take credit for like my early career, but they don't, even though it was there and I've written about it constantly, their inspiration. Are you still in touch with them? Yeah, yeah. I used to, we used to still play every once in a while. Nowadays, looking, not, after, uh, hips. looking after hips, right? <laughs> so I'm always just worried that something bad will happen if I try and move that fast. But yeah, we used to play um, regularly on a Wednesday and have a pint of Guinness afterwards. But they're still, we're still in touch. I mean, many of their children now play and are, are grown ups. So, yeah. And how did you get from that first session? to actually, as you say, manifesting your position in the NBA? I didn't know how to get there. I just knew that I couldn't go directly there because I was bad. I was sure. very bad at Self basketball. Self-awareness key. Right, very key. I was terrible. So instead, I went on a, a bus, this, the kind of mega bus type thing of its time, um, down to London to a place... I think the Fulbright Commission, I'm not sure if it even has an office here anymore. But right, the scholarship program. Yeah. And they have books there where you can get access to every um, high school in America. And I knew I needed to go to high school because I was bad. Because the only way I could stay there in America is to get a scholarship. So I had to get good enough to get to high school. And mm. then in high school, I had to get good enough to get a scholarship. So we made a plan of how it would happen. Uh, it didn't turn out to be quite so um, straightforward, but... We found this book full of high schools, and I went through, and I realized this is pre, hmm, this is pre internet for right. for people listening. So uh, it was writing letters, actual letters, and so I went through, and every four or five pages, I'd stick a pen in and thought, oh, there it is. School in Roanoke, Virginia. School in Toledo, Ohio. School in uh, New York, and I sent them a, all the same letter. I just wrote a th three thousand letters to America saying, hi, my name's John. I'm six foot eight and I was, as I was at the time and black, uh, can I play for your team? And I sent those letters off. I assumed I'd get a lot of responses because mm -hmm. I assumed that I was as uncommon in America as I am here. Uh, but apparently there's more tall people. There. So I got three replies, two of which were no's. One was a lovely no that I don't remember somehow. One was an awful no, like why would we want foreign talent? Sure. And then one was a, we'll give you a go. And that was in Toledo, Ohio, which is not the most exotic place that a person can go. But I had a coach there called uh, Ed Heinchel who took care of me. And so you went over at what age? I was 18 by the time I went over. My mother wouldn't let me leave until I did my A-levels. Uh, I did not do incredibly well in my A-levels. But, but you did them? I did them as, as, as told to. I still was in this phase where I didn't like school or academia. Um, that came much later. Just quickly, why do you think that you enjoyed books so much and didn't enjoy school or academia? Uh, yes, because I think school sometimes is designed to make you hate learning. Right. Whereas books are worlds of learning. You just dive in and in order to really enjoy what you're what you're watching, what you're and, and it is watching, even as you read it, you're what makes books great is that you're watching it in your head. It's not that you're reading the words, you're watching it in your head. So this whole world is playing out there and it makes you curious about things that you can explore at your own pace. So lightsabers. It wasn't lost on me in my bedroom with a torch 
that when there was two torches, the light passed through each other. And so how do lightsabers work? So here I am as a person who doesn't care about physics, un trying to understand wave particle duality. And actually recently, Brian Cox and Neil deGrasse Tyson were doing a podcast where they were talking about the fact that actually there is a way that light can interact. So it does bounce off each other like lightsabers would. So that's why reading is so different. You, mm. you get to self-explore. When I was a kid, there were these books you could buy where you'd have a decision point. And if you wanted to do this thing, you would mm -hmm. go to page 48. If you want to do this thing, you want to go to page 36. And so it's this idea that learning becomes something that you get to explore for yourself. And it's done in a world building kind of way rather than just learn these things for no apparent reason. So you got to Ohio. What was the learning curve like there? Because I can imagine oh. going somewhere where basketball is also a very common sport, played, mm -hmm. I'd assume, in most high schools. Yep. Um, and you're coming from somewhere where someone told you one day to go to a basketball club, you went there, separate to your school, and then traveled to the US. What was that like when you arrived? I can imagine it was a very different experience from your experience in Stockport. It really was. I got off a plane in Toledo, Ohio in the summertime and the temperature was a thousand degrees. It was a thousand degrees. I thought I had moved to a desert planet. It was unbelievably hot. The, the, the plane doors opened. It, it, it was so unreal. I got to get my bags and then got through, you know, th that part. And I was met by the coach who's talked to me and he was lovely and warm with a big bushy mustache. And I couldn't understand a word he said. So, well, I spent the first, he was lovely, but a, a Midwestern accent because for, for in Britain we are, are, well, at least we were, what we got was Hollywood accents that West Coast accent that we can kind of decipher. And I couldn't understand him. So I spent the first probably 10 days of my experience just nodding and smiling at him, <laughs> hoping that whatever he was saying, you know, I could see he's offering this and I'd be like, yeah, that's great, thank you. It was just horrifying. And then the sport part, I'd done a couple of days of practice a week to play a game on the weekend. I arrived and they showed me the gym it's a 2000 seat arena. The community comes to watch them play. Unreal. We were expected to run on a track. We were expected to lift weights. And I was like, this is, this is proper work. Cause I still like booked and books and pie. And there was none of that. No books, it no was pie. discipline. It was meal plans. It was proper work. Yeah. It was, it was an amazing, Learning curve is not right because I, I just strapped in and did as I was told. And that's the only, it's the only reason I survived because I knew that I had one year to get a scholarship. And if I didn't do it this year, I'd come home. And I told everybody I was going to play in the NBA. I wrote it in my high school yearbook in England. Right. So you had a commitment to keep. And people laughed then. So now it's like, I have no choice. I have to do this. And how did you get there? I, uh, a bumpy road. I got a scholarship to Vanderbilt University. I spent a year there with my roommate, a guy called Matt Maloney, lovely bloke. And he and I were both pulled into our coach's office. He did not think that we were very good. And he told us that if we wanted to play, we should transfer to a division two or three school. I was in a division one school, which is high powered stuff. And we didn't believe him. So we went our separate ways. He went to University of Pennsylvania and I went to Penn State. Uh, I went to Penn State because I was promised nothing there, and I thought it was believable. It's a, people don't realize what it's like to to be recruited uh, if you've got any talent at all. And I was okay. Uh, I was recruited by one university where I showed up in in the university. I was directed to the gym, a twenty thousand seat arena, and suddenly the music starts playing, and you can hear a game going on. And they've created a tape with my name in it. John Amici gets the ball. Three seconds, two seconds, he shoots, he scores, and the crowd goes wild. They created this image of talking about manifesting of the future. And I thought that seems unrealistic. And so I didn't go there. 
it was so attractive. I thought that's. I'm gonna this be feels, let down. This feels like the child catcher, right? This is too good, <laughs> and suddenly the gates will close, and I'm trapped. And then I went to Penn State, and it's, it had this six thousand seat arena, which is small for a university, and some old, well, what I at the time considered to be old guys, professors were jogging painfully around the track that was at the top of it. And it it was all right, but nothing special. And the coach came in and sat with me and he said, uh, yeah, you know, if you're willing to work really hard, and only if you're willing to work really hard, we think we can help you become a player. But if you're not, this is not the place for you. And I was like, that man's telling the truth. And so I went to Penn State. It was an amazing experience. Played there, um, didn't get drafted. Drafting is, is where the best players are selected. It's a devastating to sit there watching television, uh, watching the television and watching the names of people you played against and played better than. And off they go to the league. I didn't get drafted, so I had to go through what they call free agency, which means you show up and you just try and work your way onto a team. And I did that in Cleveland and ended up starting in Cleveland my first year. Um, and that was my trip to the NBA, which ended after one year uh, because I just wasn't good enough. I needed more skills. So I ended up coming back to Europe before I eventually got back to the NBA with Orlando, which was my, hmm, as much as there was one, it was my heyday. Yeah. And that's, it's so funny because when you hear about people's stories and you hear you know that professional bio we were talking about mm -hmm. you hear they did this they did this they did this you always hear such a surface level approach um or kind of story of what how they got there but also you know as you say the first time you were in the nba you showed up and tried to get in you were there for a year yep. and then you had to leave because in your mm. words you weren't good enough yep. What were the biggest things you learned in that time that have stayed with you now in terms of the kind of, I guess, probably the perseverance that you had to have to really end up making it? I was very fortunate that I was surrounded by good veterans, they call them, older players. Um, and so a lot of the stuff that I learned wasn't on the court. I learned about the fickle nature of fandom. The idea that you can have a great game and if you lose, they can still hate you. Uh, you can have a great game, and even when you win, they'll love you today. But if the next, if the very next game you have a bad game, mm. they'll hate you again. This is really interesting to watch how these people would want to hug you coming off the court on a Thursday, and then on a Saturday, they'd be like "boo," and they'd want to throw something at you. So it was really interesting to understand the nature of fans as distinct from friends or followers or right. something else more profound uh, but also I had really good veterans who who taught lessons without even knowing it I think I came in with a rookie uh, I always think whether I should say his name or not but he was a he's, he was a long-standing player in the league eventually he he was drafted he was high profile really talented and I came in with him and he came into the you know, you drive into the arena underneath and we drove in and I followed him in a in a car that I'd bought a few years earlier and had not changed. It, it was all right. It was, but you could very distinctly tell I wasn't one of the players who right. was on the very big contracts. And following both of us was a veteran player called Michael Cage. And he saw that this guy had bought himself another new car. This was the second new car I'd seen him in. And Michael looked at him and said, is this a new car? He said, yeah. He said, give me the keys. Give me the keys. And he gave him the keys. He said, get in the car. And he drove him back to the dealership and made the dealership take the car back. I was like, wow, look at that. And, and it wasn't, it was because as a young player, you don't realize there's tax. You don't realize that you've got to, you've got to make this money last, not just for this year, but for your pensionable future, right? if you want to have a lifestyle similar in the future, it's like, you don't need this. You just need the one car. That'll all, all you need right now. And I thought, what a wonderful example of, of, cause it's not really, it's not related to the core, right? It's just you as a human being don't make the same mistakes that I've seen others make. Mm. I thought it was so, so lovely and so bold. Mm. Give me your keys. We're taking this back. It's so funny. Cause I often think about the, 
there's a better way of saying it, but I often think about the saying that's kind of like, the good news is that nothing lasts forever. The bad news is that nothing lasts forever. And I always think about that because I think that, first of all, it's so true in entrepreneurship mm-hmm. that, you know, I experience it a lot. You can have the best day ever. It can be followed by the worst day ever. It kind of goes round and round and round. But I think so true as well, especially within sports. I mean, with everything, but within sports and that kind of real need to know yourself and to get to know yourself and get to know your values because even as much as the bad things will not last, the good things also yeah. will return to normal. Like you can't constantly be on this high, whether it's a, you know, emotional high, whether it's like the top point of your career, what goes up must come down. Yep. And that kind of psychological need to know yourself well enough that you will be okay, whether it is up or whether it is down. Yeah, I think it, it's, it's such a profound point because you don't think about it as an athlete when you're younger. You don't think about the fact that what your body can do today, it is likely once you reach the age of 23, 24, it won't be doing which the same thing. Which is so things, young. Right? I retired at 35 in sport, which is why my body is not in great shape. But so I had a really long career and I was very highly aware of it in my 30s. When essentially every after every practice and game, I had to immerse myself up to my neck right. in an ice bath just to be able to walk. But when when I was young, and um, this story was, was back when I first started, I had no concept that that it would be over or that ten years would go like that. And I wasn't really thinking about what's next. Other, I, I had a different thought about what's next because I knew it would be about my head. It would be about psychology. I knew I'd be a psychologist. But I know that lots of other athletes, they don't think about what's next in any way that's profound. And they often don't imagine, to your point, that what's good won't last forever. Mm. And it can be an ankle twist. It can be a tiny thing that means you're done. I, I spoke to a young woman the other day. She's a football player and her everything is great. And she played for a national team. She played for on the Premier League teams here. And then she doesn't because she gets a, a scan of her heart that says she's got a, a, a heart disorder that's, while it won't stop her from living her life, it would be incredibly damaging if she continued to play at that level. And so just one second, all that she worked for is shifted and changed and she's had to adapt. And so what has knowing that shifted for you psychologically? Part of it has made me want to do stuff that it can be more enduring. So my brain, I think, is in pretty decent shape and is likely to be in better shape than my body for a while. And so how can I do things that sit in my new sweet spot, which is not movement, but agile mind instead of agile body? So it's it's done that. How can you find joy in activity still is one of the things that I've, I've kind of shifted from. I have a bike now. I have an e-bike because I'm... I mean, I weigh 150 kilos, so getting up hills is not as easy as you'd imagine. <laughs> I mean, it's hard for me. <laughs> but it's created this world for me where I, you know, I, I go out very early in the morning because I, you know, I just don't want to deal with the traffic. Where, but I'm, I'm grinning like an eight-year-old on my bike as I ride to the top of Greenwich or I, I ride out to parts of West London from, from central London. Um, I did a trip down to Exeter because I teach down there. So I did a trip, took my bike down on the train and then just rode around Exeter. It was amazing. Mm. So I, I try and find, I suppose that's what it's taught me. I, I, a, I've got to keep moving so that my brain keeps working well, but also just for the joy of it. Um, and then find something that I can do that's really legacy worthy with my, with what the faculties I have left. Right. And also the things where the journey itself or the doing itself are have the value rather than the kind of end goal. That's a really important point. Yeah. Because I, I, half the time I'm on my bike, I have no idea where I'm going. I'm just riding... <laughs> And then when it's enough, I feel like it's enough and I head back. But it's just joyful. Mm. Yeah. And how did it feel when you did end up retiring from the NBA? Oh, amazing. <laughs> amazing. <clears throat> it did feel amazing. I was so, it hurt. It hurt. My back hurt. My knees hurt. Everything hurt. You're 35 years old and you're looking at, I was 35 years and I'm looking at, at these 20 odd year olds and they're saying, yeah, let's start for the game. Let's go out. And I'm like, I'm going to be in an ice tub for the next 40 minutes. 
and I don't, I can't have a drink during the week. I just, I can't have a drink and then practice tomorrow. Just one drink, I'm done. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I can now do the thing that I know I'll be really good at, because I was a, was a very average basketball player for an NBA player. It still makes me better than most people, but <laughs> yeah, I would. but but. <laughs> Sometimes you, I have to remind myself that there's only <clears throat> there's only been four thousand of us right. who played in the NBA ever, and so whilst I'm incredibly average amongst that pantheon, I'm pretty decent. But still, <laughs> it's distracting me with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're like, yeah, yeah really proud, yeah. <laughs> really happy to be there. But still, when I ended, I was like, I, I'm, I can find something where, and it's nothing to do with me. As yes, studies have helped, but fundamentally, I think my brain just works in a way that. It, it helps to solve people problems really well, often without me doing much intervention other than listening, pausing, and what seems to come out is the right response. So I've now got a job that's just, it's not simple, but it's effortless in some ways uh, that feels important too. Because I do reflect on the fact that I, if you boil down your job, to its core components, sometimes it can be quite chastening. It can help you really think about it. And when you boil down basketball, I put a ball in a hole for a living. <laughs> you know, I put a ball in a hole for a living. Right. And I did that about 40% of the time. Yeah. And those were good days. And you suddenly realize, oh my goodness. I mean, you boil down other jobs. I worked in the NHS for 10 years, and you look around at porters. You boil down their job. They ensure people who need urgent help get to the place that they need at the right time, and then they do it in such a way that they feel less scared. Mm. You think of some of the nurses that I know, and they do some of the, the filthiest and dirtiest, and off, but they uh, are also there giving support to the family members as well as often quite ornery and frightened patients. And so, yeah, I, I sometimes look at my old job and think I've got some making up to do. <laughs> and how did you move into psychology? I started to study while I played. Uh, there's a lot of downtime in professional sports. Right. So people often marvel at it. But fundamentally, if you're going on a plane from Orlando to Portland, for example, you've got six hours there where you can either play cards. I never learned how to play cards. Um, or you, some of the some of the guys would bring the early um, games machines with them. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, or I could study, and so I'd have not the whole six hours, but four hours to do a bit of work. And so I, I took courses, uh, distance education. Uh, the MBA helped with that. Uh, found me somewhere that would help me do that, and that's. I wanted to make sure that by the time I finished, I would be ready to go. Yeah, it's really important. And you speak a lot about kind of productivity within psychology and the use of your time and mm -hmm. um, how important getting these things right are. Could you talk to me a little bit about your saying that you cannot be part-time with your time? Yeah. I think people... They don't understand, and I didn't as a younger person perhaps too, but you don't understand how important it is to utilize your time effectively and purposefully. And this is not about burning yourself out and working, you know, 15 hour days. I don't think that that's important or good or useful in the longer term. But sometimes we fritter away time kind of half dabbling at stuff. And one of the things that basketball teaches you is not to do that. So, so I would go to a gym and when I was practicing in the summertime, not around my team. And if I got there and I started working out and I realized I was distracted and what I'm doing is kind of half-hearted, I would leave. 20 minutes in, I would leave, knowing that the next time I came, I would have to make up for that and do an hour of really solid work. But it made me rethink how I'm going to use my time. I'm not going to use my time in a way that is forgettable and not not taking me towards anything that's really valuable that's what it means don't be part-time with it don't dabble with the moments because we have a finite number of them you, you can actually work out depending on your postcode the number of minutes and, and hours you have 
on this planet based on the average age of death. And knowing that the early part of that time, you're not doing much advanced thinking when you're a baby or a toddler or even into your primary and secondary school. And the latter part of that, you're probably not doing your most stuff too, because many of us, we don't keep all our faculties as we get older. So you've got this period of time to be remarkable, to be impactful, to be purposeful, to be joyful. Don't waste those moments. And, and that doesn't mean you can't do the frivolous. I, I, I sit down and, and laugh my ass off watching Family Guy every once in a while, and I love it. And it's, it is in and of itself a good. But then there's time when I want to do, when I'm with clients, when I'm with people who need my support, if they're getting an hour of my time, they're getting all of it. There is no one else. I'm going to remove the world around them and they will only be, and they will know that in this hour, there's only you. There's nobody else. And this is for you. And there's something about that that I think is a gift to other people and to yourself to have these properly purposeful, connective moments. And how do you recommend that people keep that intentionality around their time and kind of full concentration on one thing or you know being one place mm -hmm. or whatever it might be when we're now in a world of so many distractions and not just distractions and kind of billion dollar companies that are vying for your attention pretty successfully a lot of the time yep. but also on top of that multitasking is so heavily rewarded and encouraged because we're kind of taught that we have infinite capacity to make money mm. if only you're doing all of the 10,000 things yeah. which you could be doing and you are lazy if you're not doing or so the narrative goes yeah it, it is hard because there's so many terrible messages out there about people I, um i i'm too old for tiktok i know this but i am on tiktok and i enjoy it very much there are mornings where it's three o'clock in the morning and i realize i've been watching tiktok for three hours <laughs> and so it's That's not that so I relatable, John. It's, it's not it's not <laughs> that I am perfect in this, right? That, and I recognize there's a consequence to it, um, and on and on and on. There are people on 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 these platforms who will tell you that if but for the fact that you if you only woke up at four in the morning, and if only you only need there's one bloke who's such an idiot, whose his idea is you can have three days in one day. I go four o'clock in the morning until nine, and then I go from 10 until, it's like, no, you don't. I don't sleep when I'm dead. Right, <laughs> right. But why have that kind of life? But instead, just consider, what is this for? If, if that image that you had, it's so wonderful. I love this five-year hence bio. If each one of the people listening had that five-year hence bio, and then they just thought, is this taking me towards this? or away from it. My three o'clock in the morning TikTok things, they are fun. And I, there is such a lot of, that I learn on there. This is amazing. There's, there's, I learned about black BSL the other day. The idea that, the, that there's a language differentiation in, in sign language. Uh, so this is what's popping, which I think is, <laughs> which is amazing, right? It's just, I think that's amazing. So it is of value, but it's not necessarily taking me towards where I want to go. So it's something to be limited, mm. right? Not to do that once a week, but to just keep that as a limited thing. And then my bike in the morning, is that taking me? Yeah, actually, because it's keeping me healthier, keeping my heart taking over. It's joyful. All of that advances me towards that picture I have for five years from now. And it really is helpful for you to proportionally allocate then the frivolous, the joyful, the purposeful, the meaningful, the important but dull. It helps you prioritize all that stuff. I think that's so interesting. And I love that idea of kind of proportionate allocation when it comes to your time. We're so inundated with so much information on how mm -hmm. to live your life correctly and even most joyfully and most profitably and like all of these different things. The hardest part of all of that is the reality of the fact that we're all so human mm -hmm. and you can have all of the best intentions of being you know fulfilled every day and doing the right thing and waking up early because it makes you happy even though you think it doesn't and all of these different things but that proportionate allocation is that reality mm -hmm. it's the it's not about 
spending 100% of your time doing what you're saying and kind of being completely fulfilled and making sure your brain's working and making sure you're even ticking off the things to that five-year bio. It's, you know, that 10, 15, 20% of that might be the things that get you to that bio happily because you've not felt like a racehorse all of that time or an yes. athlete all of that yes. time. And yes. I think that's so powerful and really actionable as well. Yeah, it's no good reaching your goal as a husk. You arrive there physically and psychologically, emotionally, unable to enjoy what, you, what you've now achieved. It's awful. I, I'm telling people all the time, I, I heard this phrase online, or I saw this phrase online, you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm -hmm. I love it. I use it all the time. Fill your cup. You must fill your cup because especially in the context of leadership, which is what I teach, uh, for the most part, I'm telling people to, as leaders to do really effortful stuff, to pour from their cup. And you can't do that if you're not filling it up with something. And I don't mean in that episodic way. And I hope you're not one of those people who does that. The idea that you'll burn yourself to a crisp for six months and then take a nice holiday thinking that makes up for it all. I hope you're not doing that because it doesn't work. I know. It doesn't I'm work. I'm well aware. Thank right? you. <laughs> You've got to find stuff on a regular basis. Absolutely. And and it, for, for really purposeful, especially for entrepreneurs that listen to you, I'm sure it feels like it's indulgent. Right. But it's not indulgent. When you decide to not wake up until 10 on Saturday because you really busted it all through the week, or you have a morning where you would normally go for a workout, but you're so exhausted because you had a 11 o'clock late finished meeting or whatever. That time you give yourself in the morning to just, I'm just going to change my alarm. It, my, my alarm goes off at 5.15, and there are plenty of nights when I say, actually, based on today and what's going to happen tomorrow, I'm going to give myself 20 minutes more. I'm going to give myself an hour more, and that's what I'm going to do. I, I mean, I think it's so true, and I speak a lot about the fact that productivity and self-care are seen as these two opposing yes. schools of thought. Whereas actually self-care is productive. You cannot have productivity without self-care and you cannot have self-care without also being productive and doing things to reach your goals or whatever it might be. And I think that it's exactly that. It's the ability, that changing your alarm, that in quote unquote indulgent activity is not just not indulgent, it is an essential part of the success. Yes. And I think that the point that I really internalize that and the point that I made sure I was filling my cup weekly, often daily. You know, you can't always have it how you want, especially mm -hmm. within kind of entrepreneurship because you will be humbled immediately. Yep. Um, but the, the more that was kind of dotted throughout my week, throughout my life, just the alleviation of kind of all of it. And I think that I was so obsessed with the fact or with trying to do it right that actually trying to do the noble thing was actually incredibly unproductive. Yes. And I think it's that need to internalize the fact that burning yourself out is not productive and therefore a certain amount of work is not productive. And I think also we forget the fact that productivity is not about length of time spent. It's actually about the smallest amount of time spent to get yep. the maximum effort. Yep. And I think that in a world now where we seem to be, or we're told we're constrained only by our time, for how much money we can make or how successful we can be and all of these things and just whether we can have three days in one, that's the only thing that dictates whether we're going to be successful. Yeah. It's the unlearning of that myth and not just the unlearning, but also then the integration into your everyday and the true internalization that self-care is productive yes. is so life-changing and it's hard to know and it's hard to keep reminding yourself. I have to remind myself every single day that self-care is not indulgent it is essential and it is productive it's the only way it's just it's bizarre really because many of these and i hate this term but many of these alpha type <laughs> men I, I heard somebody else talking about alphas <clears throat> i wish this was my original thought but it's like when somebody tells you they're an alpha you should believe them and you should just say yes because alpha is a type of radiation and it's a type of radiation that's so weak that it doesn't <laughs> penetrate into the body, but if it gets inside the body, it does tremendous harm. So you believe them. But alpha is also a type of program. It's a type of program that's so buggy it shouldn't be released to the public. 
And so when somebody, when a man tells you that they're an alpha, believe them. I love knowing that. those things are true. I it's love so that. amazing, right? So amazing. But we've got to break out of this because it's many of these people, they love sports. How have they missed the primary lessons of sports? Do people honestly think that sports people spend most of their time doing activity? We don't. We spend most of our time stretching, uh, proper nutrition, psychological training, ice baths. Recuperating is what we do, not, not crashing, which is what most entrepreneurs do, I think. Mm. They do these days that start ridiculously early, um, end ridiculously late, and then they're gone. As in, they just they don't really even fall asleep. You just kind of, whoop, you're gone, and then you're wrenched out of that to awakeness again, mm. and then you do it again. Whereas really productive people, they recuperate. What do I need to do to recuperate? Is today a day where what I need is the ridiculousness of Family Guy to mm. recuperate? Is today the day I need yoga to recuperate? Is today the day, what's the thing that will help me today to recuperate? Is today the day I went to... Um, I joined Ronnie Scott's uh, jazz club. And I love Ronnie you know, Scott's. And, I, and I've been going just randomly to nobody I know particularly. And it's just such a, a it, I was going to use joyful again, but it's just such a, to watch other people be that expert that a group of artists are looking at each other while they're performing and they're just kind of nodding at each other to take over for a moment. It's like watching a proper team in action, right? And it's just amazing. So what do I need today to recuperate so that I can really kick ass? If you're mm. really interested in winning. And that is one of the most toxic things about entrepreneurship is the fact that you can have every well-meaning bone in your body in terms of those things. And actually the very nature of it is so fickle, especially, you know, until you're at that stage where you're not going to fall over no matter what. And that yep. really doesn't exist as we've learned with, you know, huge companies not and not working out and all of these different things. But is the fact that like, I consider myself really quite good now at knowing my boundaries and knowing my limits. And when people ask, what happens if you don't tick off this in a day? Or what happens if you, like, how do you do that alarm all the time? Or whatever it might be. I know that the only way I am able to do that is because I also know when I'm not able to do that and I don't do it. Yeah. And like, I trust myself enough to know that that's not a lazy approach, that it's a needed approach. And I've built that kind of trust with myself over time. But I think one of the, hardest parts of entrepreneurship and most toxic as I say because I do genuinely think it's that push and pull toxic mm -hmm. um kind of elastic band behavior is that you can have all of those best intentions and actually if your business needs that that day right then and this kind of idea of having no boss is a complete lie it's the customers it's the investors it's yep. whatever it might be then it needs that and you can say these are my boundaries and it's going to say cool well, I'll just die then as your business or yep. whatever it might be, which is so tough. And you have to be able to have those parameters around it as well and kind of those rules for yourself that you're able to say, okay, I wouldn't usually do this now, but it is needed. And what, what gives today? Because you know, I agree with you. There, there's sometimes, even for, for my business, right? There's right. sometimes like, you know, do we can we say no to this? You know, this is a client that's in a different time zone. I'm going to have to get up at four o'clock in the morning to do this. But even there, we think, what is the, what is the, what is the pull to that push? Right. Right. So yes, okay, because it's so urgent. You're a great client. You really need us four o'clock in the morning, which means a three o'clock start to be ready for that four o'clock. But something must give somewhere, right. and if it's not that day, it's going to be the day afterwards. Because if it's not, then something bad will happen. People, if 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 you can embrace as an entrepreneur that. Your best decision making is not possible when tired. Your best self is not possible with your colleagues, because um, when you're when you're tired, and I don't just mean kind of I didn't sleep well, but that kind of enduring in your bones tired that comes from not being mm -hmm. taking care of yourself, you resort to your limbic system, to to the part of your brain they call it the lizard brain, the part of your brain that's just not great at doing anything other than fight, flight, freeze. It's just not great at anything else. Right. So you're going to make poor decisions because, you know, one thing about entrepreneurship, and I, I'm no expert there, but ag agility of your mind, sophistication of thinking is often what grabs you through the difficult times, not just bold, hmm. right? And that, your lizard brain only does bold. 
bold and, and binary is mm-hmm. what that does. My lizard brain is very bold and binary. Right. And, and that's, you know, every once in a while it'll come out right. But most of the time it's going to serve you wrong. So just give yourself a chance. Right. So it really is that internalization of the fact that like, yes, you can do that now. And you probably do need to do that now. And that is really annoying. And that goes against your boundaries and all of these things. But if you do that now as well and do it well and go ahead, but know that you're going to have to not do something some other time. Yep. And I think the majority of people only learn that the hard way and that's fine, but you do need to be able to internalize and learn that. And I think that's one thing that I've definitely kind of spent a lot of time being like, okay, you can't, you can't break it completely. Like you have to take these rules into account and that kind of, you can't pour from an empty cup analogy. It's like, no, you can keep trying to pour and you will keep trying to pour. Literally nothing of value is coming out. Exactly. It's just air. And then the people around you have to pretend that something is yeah, coming out because right. it's just air and you're not doing your best stuff. We have a time back rule in my company, a weekly time back. So th- there will be times when some of our trainers will be training late into the evening. But the next morning, they don't start. We mm-hmm. schedule in a way that you start later. Now, you can still get up at the time you want to. You don't have to go and do yoga or anything. But you can't work. Cannot work. And it's not because we want to be nice to everybody. We want to be pleasant. But that's not why. It's just I know we've got this this woman called Gina who's just, in the last year, it's like there's nothing she can't do. It's awesome to watch. Nothing she can't do. And because of that, there's more and more stuff that she's being asked to do. And we watched her a little bit and we're like, hmm, that's Gina minus 10 right there now. She, and still awesome. Nobody else would notice, but we noticed. And it's like, yeah, well, let's just adjust this. Yeah. Because I want Gina for the next 10 years. Right. And that's unrealistic in most companies, right? Because somebody's going to see her and go, must have you. But I want her for the long term. I don't just want her to be this flash of wonder yeah. for 18 months. Mm-hmm. I want her to... And I want when she leaves for her to know that this is the kind of person, this is the kind of place where we saw you grow, thought you were brilliant, didn't want you to burn out. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, that is really, really valuable. And how can we, with this in mind, stay motivated over long periods? Part of motivation, well, motivation is is a number of different things. It's a cool area. Uh this is a nerd out area. It's a number of really cool things. So one of them is for our personal motivation, the more vivid the picture you've got of what you want, the more stepwise it is. So five years is really good, but it can be a bit esoteric for some people. And so um, ha- have you got like a four-year or a, or a two-year just to give you a bit of in-between, especially if you're, I can imagine your five-year plan is quite ambitious. It's got quite a lot that's more than perhaps what you're doing now. Most people, that might be enough for you, but for many people, they need, hmm, I just need an interim step here that gives me a little bit of a closer to home yeah. picture. I so need that, to be able to see it tomorrow. Like I need to know what tomorrow right? looks like accordingly. And I do too. I love what needs to be true and I break it down. I know what I want to be in five years. I knew I was going to be a psychologist when I was seven years old. So I knew, and here I am. I'm not quite the kind of psychologist I'd imagined at seven, I like to believe it's a little more sophisticated now than then. But what needs to be true, I bring it back to the kind of month-on-month basis. So that's mm-hmm. one thing you can do. The other thing is people is part of what motivates in, Inside of an organization, even if it's just you and a couple of entrepreneur friends, the connectedness between people is really important for motivation. The idea that you know people who are going to keep you accountable, accountability buddies, right? The idea that you say, you describe your vivid idea of what you're going to do and what it takes to get there this quarter. And you've got somebody who's saying, is the way you're operating right now really congruent with what you said you want to do? So it's not me telling you how to behave. It's just, you told me that you want to do this and I've noticed you're not really doing this. You can do it with anything, right? So if you wanted to, I don't know, there's probably people getting ready for their beach bodies for the summer. This is as good as it's going to get for me. (laughs) But if you've told everybody, yeah, I'm going to lose a bit of weight, I'm going to have a regimen, I'm going to work out, a good friend would tell you not you're fat or anything else, but they would say, hey, weren't you telling me that you're going to work out? I've noticed you you haven't been on your bike for like a month now. It's part of that motivational piece. And then the other part is for, for, for bosses is that one of the biggest motivators for the people around you is is just is you your authentic connection every it's uh, what's it called introjected regulation is what it's called it's not important but it's um there's a continuum of motivation most people think you either 
extrinsically motivated, I'll do it if you pay me enough, or intrinsically motivated, I'd do it for nothing. I've never met anybody who's intrinsically motivated and will do it for nothing, really. Because um, you always get something, even working in a charity shop, if that's what you're doing on a weekend, it's for something. But in between, there's these other stages, and one of them is something most of us are familiar with, the idea that in school, we did really well in a subject that we didn't care about because we loved the teacher. Mr. Greg for me, my biology teacher. You have a lot of ties to Greg's. All right. Yeah. I know. It's a theme in my life. <laughs> it's the bane of my life. Going for a sponsorship? Uh, right. I know, well, I wish, right? Uh, no, that would be so dangerous for me. I mean, I would be the Michelin man in seconds <laughs> if I had access to free Greg's. It would be really problematic. Anyway, um, so Mr. Greg was my biology teacher, and he was incredible because everyone, I hated school. I hated it. Uh, secondary school. Uh, it's a different school now than it was then, but back then I hated it. It was like Hogwarts without the magic. It was a grammar school. The teachers wore robes. Hated it. But Mr. Greg, every once in a while, I would walk through the corridors, and it's a, it's a, it's a really difficult thing to be surrounded by other people and yet completely alone. And that's what school felt like to me. I was surrounded by people, all of them below my shoulder height but none of them who really interacted with me in any way that was pleasant. But Mr. Greg would see me and stop me and ask me how I was, and he wouldn't let me go just by saying fine. And it was like five minutes, once every two weeks or so. And I thought, this built this connection with him. And I was like, I would never do anything that got in the way of this connection I had with this one person. And so when I was sitting in his classes, he was so excited about mitochondria and cell walls and stuff I didn't care about. And all I thought was in this class is how I ensure that I keep that connection that's so important. And bosses forget that they have this power, this idea that an authentic connection to the people you work with will allow them to do often the boring, dull stuff, because mm. I, I can't speak for you, but in my organization, I get to do a lot of the sexy, interesting stuff, mm. um, right at the cold face, right at the innovation edge. And other people have to QA documents. Other people have to create PowerPoint slides. Mm. Other people have to do a boring analysis that I get to describe to a client and, and, and do stuff with. And that work, dull and mundane as it is, gets done at high quality because we maintain this connection of motivation. Yeah, that's so interesting that you say that because I would say that one of the things I've struggled the most with the companies growing and you know being way more people than I kind of ever would have expected is the fact that I like to be close to and actually close to the people that I work closely with like I find it very hard to work closely with people and not you know know about some of their life and how they are and what's going on and all of these different things and I do how on a completely personal level how would you say that that is maintainable at a level where you know you're seeing more people every day than you would kind of be able to know everything about yeah I mean, you, you won't be able to get the comfort of all the knowledge that you might have otherwise had, or it certainly won't come as immediately. But I think sometimes you have to remember about being patiently curious. The idea that with a smaller group of people, if you're only surrounded by a handful, a couple of meetings with people, and you spent a lot of time with a small number of people, you've, you've learned, oh, the names of your kids and, or, or, or your partner and, and the, the holiday you went on, you get all this stuff immediately. With more people, You'll have more fleeting interactions, but as long as you're willing to divulge, to share a bit of you, they will want to share just a piece, but you'll, you'll just have to be patient about the fact that I've only got this one small piece, but the way you honor it is mm -hmm. by holding on to that piece, because lots of people, what they do is they just want to learn a fact about a person because they think that's what connecting is. And then the next time they meet, they've forgotten the name of the kid that they told them about, or they've forgotten that, oh, you know, the last time we talked, your kid was feeling unwell. So that's the bit that's important, right. not the depth of it, but the idea that you cherish the piece that you have. And what qualities would you say that all the greatest leaders you've spoken to, taught, interacted mm. with, all have in common? They all want power. To be a great leader, you have to want power. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? It's, mm. it's like, ooh, it feels ugly. But it's so important. You have to want power. There are two different, well, there's multiple types, but there's a, there's a, a theory, 
out there that talks about two types of power that leaders want. One is a, a personalized power and one is a socialized power. And it's personalized power is the idea you want power because power is good. You want power like Smaug the dragon wants power. They want to have it underneath them like gold bullion and they want to lie on it and they want to kill anybody who comes to take any piece of it. And then there's a, a socialized power approach, which I think is the most appropriate, which is you do want power and in part is because it will enhance your status and in part because it fulfills your sense of achievement and ambition. So it is, it's, it's not that it has no personal component, but it's also because what can I do with this? What could this bar do? in the furtherance of a shared goal. Mm. How can I make sure that I use this thing, not hoard it and, and lie upon it and sequester it, but how can I use this power that I have for some other good? Mm. Whether that is, you know, some of the work that, that you do in your books to try and help people see past some of the ridiculous stereotype ways of being an entrepreneur or a life that is miserable in pursuit of something glorious right? and a different way. But that's what it's about. But I think that's why it makes me uncomfortable, the assertion that to be a good leader, you need to want power. I'm not say, like not by any means saying that that's kind of completely irrelevant to me or whatever it might be. But it feels like then, if you're saying that all of the best leaders have this kind of insatiable desire for power then it stands to be true that you must want that to be a good leader do you think that's the case through all stages of like an organization do you think that power then for diff for different people means kind of different things in the way that power could be your own power of financial freedom or power could be the ability to make choices what to do with your time or whatever that might be. Yeah, all of these are different ways that power will manifest. And that's why I was saying it's absolutely appropriate that you want power in the form of money to allow you to, in terms of commerce, to allow you to not have to worry about that thing. But what does that free you up to do? When when my, my business, it's, it's difficult to convince people sometimes to do things in a evidence-based way. There's lots of charlatans out there telling businesses to operate in ways that aren't real and can't work. And so it took us a while to get some traction back in the day for my organization, for APS Intelligence. And it's amazing what happened when we suddenly started to be successful. It just freed my mind up from worrying about mm. does mortgage, is it going to get paid? Uh, our offices, we're going to have to move office or whatever else. And now I can refocus on other things. So it's actually a removed a distraction is what the use of that power has done. And that's allowed me to focus on other people. Right, and that makes complete sense. I want to reframe it slightly and mm -hmm. ask then, if someone wants to be a better leader, mm -hmm. what would you recommend are the qualities that they build? I'm not sure these alpha males will respond too well no. to needing more power. No, this is I agree. my concern. I agree. So it but it's how you want to use the power you have. That's right. the important part. So so don't for those listening, don't fixate on I, I don't want to want power. Just know that you can't enact change without it. Right. In any way. Not on the micro level, not on the macro level. Your book doesn't get written because you know how difficult it is to get a publishing deal and how to get them to behave in your deal to make sure that you can get your book where it wants to be. None of this happens uh, unless you've got some clout. So you can call it clout or power or something else. Right. But there are other qualities that it's important to have. Lots of people believe in kind of tenacity and drive and ambition. These are important qualities. Compassion and empathy, these are important qualities. They don't exist on separate tiers either. It's not either or. The combination is what makes right. them powerful. But then there's also um, there's this theory called social identity theory, which talks about the idea that actually leadership isn't about the components that must be in place within an individual. It's about reimagining the collective. What is it that we want to achieve? And I, my job is to facilitate that, that environment where others can thrive and to cede that power to people who have earned the right to now, they've shown that they'll deliver effectively, they'll show that they'll do it in the right mindful way. 
Right. So wanting more power can be not just about wanting more power over the people you work with, but also about increasing the amount of power they have so that you as a collective have more power. Yeah. You, you'll have done this in meetings. Most good leaders have done this in meetings. The idea that that I'm not the expert in the room on this particular thing. So what you do is you lever your power and say, mm -hmm. actually, um, my colleague and I were just talking about it the other day. Go ahead. Could you? And what you've actually done is you've literally poured some of your power through your voice into somebody else right? so that they have more credibility mm -hmm. just for the instant because you know they don't need it for the long term but just for that moment to break in. Yeah. So th there's lots of cool ways that you can use your power that aren't just ugly. And I want to end by asking you because I think there's a huge amount of interesting and actually very actionable psychology that you kind of clearly carry with yourself every day and impart on other people. Um, I want to ask out of everything, what do you think is the best piece of advice that you've been given? Know yourself. My mother, when I told her I wanted to play in the NBA after 45 minutes of a practice, she said one of the most frustrating things I'd ever heard. Son, would you recognize your soul in the dark? I was so, I was, I mean, even as I say that, my ears are getting hot because I was so mad that she said, what does, I've just told you I'm going to play in the NBA. Just tell me yes. It's amazing. <laughs> Would you recognize your soul in the dark? And it's like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. And she was this idea that many of us, we go through life so focused on what we want to do that we spend no time thinking about who we are. And that if we stripped away the, the labels of I'm six foot nine, I'm black, I'm a man, I'm a brother. I'm a father, I'm a whatever it is. You strip these things away and you suddenly realize you couldn't describe yourself any differently than any one of the people around you. But that's so key. Knowing yourself is key to success in life because many people are self-sabotaged by things that they just never acknowledged existed. I'm incredibly lazy. It is a fundamental tenet of who I am. But I played in the NBA and my days are busy and productive because I've built systems that stop me because I am obedient also. So if it's in the diary, I will do it. Know yourself is so important. It, most people don't. If you ask human beings, they will tell you 95% of people will say, I'm highly self-aware. Now we automatically know that's rubbish, right? Because 95% is not, that's just not real. <laughs> But there's a wonderful researcher called Tasha Yurik, and she does studies on self-awareness, and she finds of that 95%, when you do a little bit of probing, about 10 to 15% are actually self-aware. There's the first damage that comes, the idea that you think you're self-aware, but you're not. And the second damage comes because people who are self-aware are often what they call internally, you talked about before, knowing your values and your principles, internally self-aware, but they aren't externally self-aware. Mm. They don't realize that their values don't don't meet the world in the way they think they do and so the example i always give is the, is the is the person you meet who says the thing you need to know about me is that i'm direct and honest it's like they know their internal values but everybody listening to this has met that person that man usually and we all know that that person is cruel and callous and careless because his version of direct and honest comes across to others in a way that is not direct and honest, but cruel and callous and careless and thoughtless. And that's why self-knowledge is so important, because you need to know not just who you are, but how you're met by the world around you. Well, I think that's a very powerful place to end. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Thank this you. This has been fantastic. And I also would just like to say that if you ever need another business idea you should start a sleep stories because you have the most calming voice i have ever heard in my life thank you and as someone who listens to a lot of sleep stories i think they need you in the business i will do i, I will <laughs> consider it my team i do send them to sleep so <laughs> well thank you so much thank you